Namaskar and good evening. <coughs> so, today's subject of discussion that we have chosen is four seals. Sometimes this is called four seals. On other occasions, we call it uh, four uh, promulgations. Also, sometimes it is called four summaries. Some other text also talk about three summaries and things like that. In Hindi, it's called char udyodharm, dharm udodhya. So, this is there is a process of distinguishing whether you are Buddhist or not a Buddhist. There are two ways. One, when we say whether you are Buddhist or not Buddhist is not whether you belong to a Buddhist country or not belong to a Buddhist country or your parents are Buddhist or not, not in that way. One criteria of recognizing as somebody is Buddhist or not is in terms of one's conduct, behavior. So, in terms of your conduct, if you wholeheartedly take refuge to Buddha, Dharma and Sangha, then you are called as a Buddhist. So, that is in terms of conduct. But in terms of view, in terms of philosophy, still you may not be a Buddhist. So, in order to become a Buddhist, not only in terms of conduct, but also in terms of philosophy, then in addition to the process of taking refuge to Buddha, Dharma and Sangha, you also need to accept these four seals. So, these four seals are really talking about the Buddhist philosophy, which is very, very important. Although a gist of the four seals have been taught right in the beginning, after Buddha got enlightened, and also continuously. But generally it is understood that four seals are taught at the time when the Buddha was passing away. When he was passing away, he gave some pertinent advices to the followers that gathered around him. He said, the Tathagata is now passing away. You should look, he removed his upper garment and he said, look at Tathagata's body carefully. You may not be able to see this again. Tathagata is now very soon passing away. So, if you have any doubt about the teachings that I have give, gave before, like on Four Noble Truth, on interdependent origination, things like that, then ask your question and remove your doubt. So, he was very confident of his teaching. And then he taught this Four Noble, sorry, the Four Seals that all conditioned things are impermanent, all contaminated things are suffering, all phenomena are selfless and empty, and transcendence of suffering is nirvana, peace. That is what he taught. So, these four seals are called four seals. So, it is like a king's degree. When the king passes a degree, on which he puts his seal and signature, then everybody has to practice it, follow it and obey it. So, similarly, if you claim yourself to be a Buddhist, then it is very important to follow <coughs> and try to understand the meaning of these four seals. <coughs> After a lot of hardship, when Buddha got enlightened, his followers requested him to share the nectar of his teaching, the Dharma that he found. He said, I have found something which is profound, <coughs> peaceful, free from fabrication clear light, unconditioned, to whomever I teach it, nobody will understand it. So, let me 
stay in the forest. I don't want to speak. So that is that is how he reacted when he was requested to share his nectar of wisdom. So here also you can learn a lot of lessons. Ordinarily, many teachers they advertise themselves even these days. You attend my discourse in five days, you will be enlightened. You will be able to open your third eye and things like that. So there are many, you know, gurus or self-proclaimed teachers or gurus who make a show of their little knowledge without any practice. So Buddha was not like that. He was completely enlightened, but when he was requested to teaching, then he said, as I already said, nobody will understand it. Let me continue my meditation in the forest. Now he said this with few reasons. Reason number one is, by this immediate refusal to give the teaching immediately, he was actually saying that if you are interested in what I found, you must be serious. You must be, there must be some seriousness. <laughs> if you just, you know, listen to the teaching like attending a regular class, which you have to, then it, it will not help you transform in your mind and change your personality. So there must be seriousness, number one. Number two, he was, as he was saying, that what he found was really, really profound. It's not easy, so don't take it lightly. You need to make some effort, very precious. Very few people are able to go into that depth. So that, that was the message that he wanted to give. Then again, host of human beings and gods again approached him, saying that you are right, that what you found is like a nectar, very profound, not many people understand it, but some people who are intelligent may be able to understand a little bit. So please, please share your teaching. <laughs> we are not all stupid, you know, we have some intelligent people also, so share this teaching. He said something like that. And uh, then when Buddha gave the teaching, the first thing that he taught was the famous Four Noble Truths, Char Arya Satya, Four Noble Truths. In the Four Noble Truths, he said, this is suffering. This is true origin of suffering. This is cessation. This is the truth of the path. That's four. So basically he was saying, this is true suffering, this is true origin of suffering. That means on the one hand you have suffering and suffering has its cause, origin of suffering. On the other hand, this is true cessation, means cessation of suffering, which means happiness. And then this is the true path, which, which is the cause for happiness. So in simple language, simple language, what he observed was, he observed all sentient beings struggling hard to get happiness and not to get suffering. But he also observed that people and sentient beings did not know how to cultivate the causes of happiness and how to remove the causes of suffering. They were simply wanting happiness but not cultivating the cause. Simply not wanting suffering but continuously cultivating the causes of suffering. So they are therefore in a way they are unnecessarily suffering. So when he saw this, he felt very moved. Look, look at these ignorant sentient beings, you know, they, they want happiness but don't know how to cultivate happiness. They don't know the causes for it. They don't want suffering but they don't know the causes of suffering. So therefore, they continue to cultivate the causes of suffering and the result is suffering. That is exactly what is happening in today's world, everywhere. Very profound teaching. Now, this, this is what I am trying to, you know, explain it in simple languages. But if we, if we go into the deeper state, then of course, it can be very deep and all the teachings of the Buddha can be summarized into this teaching on the Four Noble Truths. And the very name Four Noble Truths, that, that means what I have taught are truths, but they will be seen as truths by noble people, Aryas. Who have, who have achieved the path of seeing darshan mark, jo bolta hai. 
who has obtained that, they can they will know exactly what it is. But we will not know. Ordinary people they see happiness as suffering, suffering as happiness. <laughs> right? We are confused because of ignorance. So therefore, what he was really saying is, look, if you really want happiness, then you must identify the causes of happiness and cultivate them, you will have happiness. If you don't want suffering, then if possible, remove the suffering, causes of suffering. If not, at least reduce the intensity of causes of suffering and you will have less suffering. And then when it comes to explaining the first noble tr truth, that is the truth of suffering. He explained it with four features. Impermanence, suffering, empty and selflessness with four features. He explained the truth of suffering with four features. Again here you will see the teaching on impermanence, suffering, selflessness there. So the four seals also more or less speak on this thing in a similar way. Now when we taught this four noble truth, he said this is true suffering. This is, he was not pointing to some outside thing, he was not pointing to the, you know, the earth as suffering or stone as suffering, he was pointing to the person who is, who has emotions, who has feelings, who is experiencing or experiences that happiness suffering. This is true suffering, this body, this psychophysical aggregate. This is impermanent. This is suffering. So that is what is important for us to understand. We are not simply Hindi me bolta hai na hawa hawa me baat nahi kar raha hai, right? Make it relevant in your personal practice. You are the one who aspires happiness. You are the one who wants to, you know, shun suffering, remove suffering. So therefore, that job has to be done by you. And the Buddha repeatedly said, "I have shown you the path to nirvana." Nirvana is up to you. Buddhas are your teachers. You need to practice. And also elsewhere he said, the Buddhas do not wash the sins of sentient beings with water. The Buddhas do not remove the negative state of existence of sentient beings with their hand. The Buddhas cannot transfer their knowledge, their realization into the mind of the suffering sentient beings. It is only by showing and teaching the path of suchness that sentient beings are freed and liberated. This is again amazing teaching because the Buddha never said, you know, you just have blind faith or faith in me and boom, you will be enlightened, you know. I will give you blessing and you will be enlightened. He never said this. He was basically saying, I'm like an experienced teacher. I can teach you. I can show you the path. But if you don't implement, if you don't follow the path, there's nothing I can do. I cannot transfer my knowledge into you. Tathagatas are teachers. And you are the doer. You have to act. Well, that I think is very, very important and relevant in today's world also. Because many times people do ceremonial practices like prayers and chantings, but don't do any practice which will change their personality, which will transform their mind. So that, that is very, very important. Now, so therefore this teaching on the four seals, although it is, it is the philosophical aspect of the teaching, but this philosophical aspect of the teaching is for transformation of the suffering human beings, is for removing the negative emotions. Because what, I, what makes us suffer and unhappy is this negative emotions. Negative emotions will not go away like that. There is a difference between the physical state and the mental state. In the physical state, if the, the physical body is not obeying your order, then you can, like the dictators do, then they can you know, chain you, they can fetter you, and they can put you in prison. To some extent, you will be controlled. But the mind can never be controlled like that. The only way to change the mind is to explain the situation, to explain the reality, and let the mind welcome it, accept it, and, and let the mind, you know, develop delight in it. Then the mind will follow it. 
So therefore, training, study and training the mind is very, very crucial. And this is also very crucial because if you look at the two states, the physical state, the body and the mental state. In the case of the body, although ordinary people like us, we pay so much attention to the body and hardly any attention to the mind. But if you look properly, you know, regarding the differences between these two, this body, however much training you give, it can make some progress, but not limitless progress. Right? If you say, if you ask the question whether the brain can be trained to limitless state, this is questionable because the brain and the mind are related. So nobody right now knows which one is making the progress, the physical brain or the mind. Nobody knows it. So therefore, it looks like the mind can make limitless progress. Right? But let me give you this example. For example, in the case of training the body, you may be today the world's number one gold medalist in long jump. World's number one. Still, you can do more training, <coughs> more practice, and you may be able to jump a little bit longer. But it will never happen that through your practice, you start jumping from one mountain to another mountain. Have you heard something like that <laughs> until now? Right? No, impossible. Because the basis on which you're giving training is physical body. Just like water, you know. When you boil water, it can change from cold to warm and then gradually heat. And then 100 degrees centigrade, it will boil. And then after that, it will not become hotter. It will simply disappear into vapor. But in the case of the training of the mind, it's not like that. It is luminous, cognitive. The more you train in it, the more clarity and cognition will increase. That's why you can study as much as you can. There's so much room, not only like gigabyte, but terabytes, you know, even more than terabytes. I don't know which term I should use, <laughs> right? <laughs> right? Because, because the, the basis on which we give the training, the mind, has that capacity. Now, the, the paradox is, in our case, that mind which we can develop to a limitless state, especially where we can develop all these higher qualities, positive qualities which we can develop, we are not paying any attention or much attention. In the case of the body which has a limited capacity, there we are hard working very hard. So this also not only is related to the, our physical, personal physical state, but also if you apply it the apply the same reasoning in the in the material development, economical development. The so-called material economical development is basically a physical development. Anything that is physical, anything that is material by nature has a limitation. So how can you develop any ma material physical thing to limitless state? So therefore this notion of every country thinking about you know, improving their GDP every year, is misplaced practice. Because the so-called material development has to come from natural resources, water, forest, minerals, so forth. Water, forest, minerals, they are limited, which we are now seeing everywhere in various parts of the world. So in the name of that progress, you are cutting trees, you are you know, using the resources and gradually the resources will come to an end, trees will come to an end. So, so that, that to think about making limitless progress is actually misplaced. But scientifically, you may create some, you know, natural resources, but I, I really doubt about it, the efficacy. So the point that His Holiness, the Dalai Lama repeatedly used to make is that in the, in the field of mind and spirituality where you can make Lim un unlimited progress, where the sky is the limit, and everybody can do that. There, you should develop the positive qualities to a limitless state. Develop strong compassion, strong loving kindness, strong patience, and so forth. 
in the field of the material development where there is a limitation, we should have some containment. And as far as the question of the development of a country is concerned, His Holiness the Dalai Lama suggested it should not be seen in relation to the GDP growth, but it should be seen in terms of the standard of the living people, people, life of the people. If the standard of every citizen in a particular country, if their standard of life is okay, then there's nothing to worry. But unfortunately, we always think about GDP growth, then again there are like hundreds and thousands and millions remain in abject poverty. So there is no kind of equal transformation in equal progress, equal development. So only if the, the few rich becomes richer and the poor people becomes poorer. Their lands are lost, their resources are lost, <laughs> they are enslaved in one form or the other, you know. So, so all this can be applied in this through this kind of spiritual practice, right? So therefore, now in order to, as I said already, now if, if this mind is so important, it can be developed to a limitless state and become compassionate, wise and so forth, then how can we do it? We have to do it through training, through study, through systematic process of thinking, you know, listening, thinking and meditation as I have explained earlier. Now think what? Listen to what? Meditate on what? Listen, think, meditate on the reality, various facets of reality. So these four seals that we are talking about is reality. Honestly speaking, it has nothing to do with Buddhi Buddhism as a, as a such. And in fact, you will, you will, I'm not, I'm, I hope I'm not biased because these days everybody speaks very highly about their own religion. <laughs> so I don't want to do that. But so, so I will challenge you and ask you to do your own, you know, research whether this is true or not. So now, for example, if here when we talk about four seals, impermanence, whether this is something that is anitya, whether this is something that is widely spoken in a particular religion or not, but impermanence is something that everybody has to accept. Nobody can challenge it. This is law of nature. Badalte rishte bolte na amlo Hindi mein. Har chij badal jate. Everything is changing. Everything is in a flux. And your body, every minute, every second you are changing. Nothing static, nothing permanent, nothing unchanging. Right? So therefore, now here you need to understand the Buddhist process of analyzing the reality. When we talk about dharma or phenomena, there are basically two types, permanent and impermanent. So today we are talking, in the fossils we are primarily talking about impermanence, not permanence, because it is the impermanent things that that we have to deal with most of the time, not so much about the permanent things, right? We have to deal with human beings who are per impermanent. We have to deal, deal with the environment which is impermanent. We have to deal with the changes which is impermanent. So therefore, what affects us, what touches us all must be affected by all as we say in you know, democracy, <laughs> so something like that, right? So therefore, the first seal is impermanence. Impermanence means Things are in a constant flux. Things are completely changing based on their causes and conditions. The causes and conditions are also changing by their causes and conditions. And those causes and conditions are also changing due to causes and conditions. That means things come into being due to causes and conditions. Nothing come into being out of nothing. Right? If you look at a mango tree, it has its unique causes and conditions. And then banana tree, it has unique causes and conditions. Somehow they are all dependent causes and conditions, but they have all their kind of common causes and conditions and unique causes and conditions. So now this shows the general structure of the impermanent phenomena. They are conditioned, they are dependent causes and conditions. So let us take a clue from that. And so what the text is primarily targeting and saying is that since nothing comes from, you know, without cause or in co in concordant causes, unfavorable causes and conditions. Things arise only through favorable causes and conditions. Therefore, in our life also, 
if you want happiness it has to be cultivated from a cause that co cause also right cause ignorance from ignorance <laughs> if you, from ignorance you try to cultivate happiness many of us are doing through anger you are trying to get happiness are you getting it no because you are trying to get happiness through wrong causes and of course without any cause nothing can arise from wrong causes also nothing can arise so therefore it has to be cultivated by the the correct causes and conditions if you want happiness likewise suffering also it has its own unique causes and conditions so those causes and conditions must be removed you know to put an end to suffering so whether it is your personal happiness or it is your spiritual you know progress you must first properly identify the causes and conditions because if you go into the wrong cause and condition doesn't matter you make a lot of effort you get nothing this is law of nature so that's why i was saying the other day that you cannot the good thing is you cannot go against law of nature you can cheat police you can cheat government you can cheat your spouse but you cannot cheat law of nature at the end of the day you will be the one who will suffer so so in buddhism we don't talk about creator god okay who is there you know punishing things like that i'm not here saying who is right who is wrong but what i'm saying is just the buddhist philosophy so in buddhist philosophy the whole structure of the buddha's teaching is based on the law of nature the foundation is in buddhism we say the foundation of the buddha's teaching is true truth true truth means conditional truth and ultimate truth which is law of nature based on that then you cultivate compassion wisdom which is the path based on that then you get a fruit similar to the causes and conditions compassion wisdom so that is the process so therefore if you really want to remove you know suffering and problems of yourself and of other people of this planet and if you want to bring happiness peace harmony then we must seek the right causes and conditions cultivate them it is 100% sure there will be causes and happiness all around so whether you really want that or not is up to you or up to us somebody really very correctly asked if happiness is something that everybody wants why is it that not many people get happiness not many people get happiness because they don't make the effort to cultivate that right causes and conditions instead they they go for shortcuts you know especially in today's world whether it's you know exam <laughs> or getting a job people try to get shortcut you know through paisa de ke chale jate hain udhar these are all wrong causes and conditions which will at the end will not guarantee you success or happiness or anything like that so therefore impermanent through understanding impermanence you should understand how things come into being through causes and conditions so therefore whether it's the you know cultivation of happiness or removal of suffering you must find the right causes and conditions that's one number 2 as i briefly mentioned yesterday also <coughs> if you are somebody who really understand in the you know, impermanence that you are changing all the time not only changing all the time but today may be your last day nobody knows i'm not trying to frighten you it can happen any time for example if there is a suddenly you know shooting let us say in ukraine around uh, right now it may be their last day you know things like that <coughs> so what is lying ahead in our life nobody knows so therefore because of this situation one we should be very careful where we are going what we are doing you know we should not be too reckless we should be very careful and then if you look at the body itself the body itself of course impermanent very fragile externally okay 
if especially if you are young, you may look handsome and beautiful and things like that. And especially if you dress up, you know, you can fool more people. <laughs> Looks nice. But, but pause for a moment and try to go a little bit deeper underneath the skin. The dermis, the epidermis, you know, the seven layers of skin go down. Then what will you see? The flesh, then, then, the, then the blood, you know. Nothing is worthy of attraction there when you go down. Then again go down, bones, then sinews, tendons, huh? marrows, and then especially if you go inside the stomach, all the fragile instruments are there. The kidney, the lungs, the, the, the fact that these are very fragile is because it is because, because they are so fragile, they are packed nicely. You know, in the modern pack system of packaging, Anything that is fragile is packed very nicely. <laughs> Not only they are packed nicely, but outside they will write a special letter saying fragile, handle carefully. That is what you see at the airport all the time, you know. It's called sambal ke ragna bhai, very fragile things. So we are, we are like that, we are fragile. Nature has packed us nicely. So all the fragile things, the lungs, the kidneys, the intestines, everything that's fragile is kept inside. And then it is, you know, cast and cast in that, you know, ribs and uh, bones. Bones are also not necessarily too strong. Right? And so therefore for us, therefore in Buddhism there is a special meditation called mindfulness of the body, mindfulness of the body. So this you can do, any student of science, you should, you know, study how human internal, you know, organs are functioning. The benefit is if you know how fragile they are, then you, sh you will be very careful. When you don't know, then you start thinking, you don't think about what is inside, you start thinking, oh, this is sweet, I must put it in my mouth. This is bitter, I like bitter, you put it. Y you start thinking that you can put anything in the mouth and there is somebody that will digest everything. It's a little bit goes wrong somewhere in the, you know, <laughs> tubes, you'll, you will have, you know, difficulty in breathing. A little bit goes, goes wrong, you know, you will suffer from convulsion. Very, very risky, very dangerous. So therefore, the more you know about this fragility, the more you will be able to take care of yourself and take care of others. Therefore, the Buddhist teachers, they say, you don't need to kill others, they will die. Because they know how fragile they are. No need to kill, they will die. Poor people, take care of them, love them. No need to bully them, no need to exploit them. That's what they are saying. But look at today's world, as I said yesterday. Making the most powerful destructive weapons to kill each other, still flexing their my, you know muscles as if they have done a great deed. Crazy, we are crazy, really crazy. Right? And yesterday I have already given you the example, you know. If two people are very, very sick lying near each, each other, they will never think about killing each other. Because both both in a very difficult situation. So they will be able to see there is no, no use trying to kill each other, rather trying to talk nicely and help each other. So basically from that, from that stance we are all sick people. Sick means, the meaning of illness and sickness means that your body or your mind is not functioning properly. And are, you, are your, <laughs> is your mind functioning properly? Meaning that are you somebody who never gets angry, never develops hatred, never develops jealousy? So when you have all these afflictive emotions, you are mentally to some extent sick from that point of view. So that illness, that sickness must be healed because you want long lasting happiness. And the medicine for that is not the external medicine of any types, but the, the medicine for that is spirituality. Spiritual practice. Spiritual practice, not necessarily, you know, holy. 
spiritual practice means something that is suitable to the growth of the mind, suitable to the growth of the body. So those spiritual practices are development of loving kindness, development of compassion, development of patience, development of wisdom, development of integrity, de development of morality and things like that. Right? So therefore, if you really, really seriously want to do dharma practice, you should understand impermanence properly. Then it will shake you and it will move you. Especially if you are somebody who is very clear and cognizant about your, you know, imminent death, which can come any time. Then you will start waking up, thinking that now what is what is what will be best for me. At the time of the Buddha, there was a mother and a daughter. So the mother and daughter went to see Buddha. Then the Buddha, pointing to the daughter, said that you have only one year to live. After one year, you are going to die, only one year. And then the mother was very, very sad. The daughter also felt very sad, and she clung to the skirt of the mother. And then, of course, they trusted Buddha. This must be the case and then went back home. Then after six months, they again came to see the Buddha. And this time the Buddha said, it has been six months since we met last time. So did you, any, did you do anything negative, destructive, sinful during these six months? Then the mother and <laughs> the, the daughter said, last time when I came to see you, you said I have only one year to live. So how can I think about doing anything destructive, negative? See? Then the Buddha said, that is my point. I do not know whether you are going to live one year or two years, three years. I said this for this purpose. And then the Buddha said, I meditate on this all the time, therefore I don't do anything that is destructive and negative. So you have learned this. That's the thing. Your life will completely be transformed if you have wholehearted conviction in that, how you relate to other people, you know, you will become humble, you will become, you know, people who are, you know, ordinarily people when they get a little bit of prestige, name and fame, then they become very arrogant, they even go like this, you know, head highly rest into the space, you know, pride goes before a fall, we have this English saying, you know, when you become proud, proud arrogant, don't see the ground, then you trip and you also fall, you see, ordinarily speaking also. So like that, you get popped pop, pop up. But people who have, you know, the, the, that understanding. For example, if you look at His Holiness, the, the Dalai Lama, I don't know how many of you have met him. But you, you look at him, I worked with him closely for 16 years. In addition to, you know, many times I've seen for so many years. You know, when he goes to, you know, give a public talk and goes among the crowd, he always goes like this, you see. laughing, smiling, shaking hand, you know, paying respect to everybody, not making any discrimination, especially extending his hand to those people who are sick and the vulnerable, you know, things like that. Because he meditates on this. And the benefit of such understanding and benefit of observing such humility is, as one Buddhist teacher says, you should yourself look at nature whether the beautiful flowers and plants grow on the exposed top of a mountain or down in the valley. If you look at the law of nature also, beautiful flowers, plants, they grow down in the valley, not on the exposed top of a mountain. So similarly, if you act like the exposed top of a mountain, become arrogant, there's no room for knowledge. You will not listen to other people. Ah, yes, I know, I know, I know. You may not, not know anything, but you will say, I know, I know, I know. Many people say this. They don't listen immediately. Ah, yeah, yeah, I know, I know, I know. So knowledgeable people are actually those who say, I don't know, who know that I don't know. People who think that they know actually don't know much. <laughs> right? So humility will be there. You will become sensitive to other people's need. You will become receptive to other people's advices. And that is how you grow. And you learn even from the mouth of a small kid. 
And the whole nature is an open book for you to learn. You don't need a special teacher also. If you are receptive, you are, if you are humble, right? So those qualities can be developed. If you clearly see your fragility, your permanent impermanence. So that topic itself is enough for us to do many, many meditations and cultivate, you know. So if you do that properly, there will be, I must say, there will be quantum leap in your spiritual progress. If you don't have this fundamental, one fundamental understanding, just like we so therefore, unless it is not what you read, but you what you learn that makes you learn it. It's not what you eat, but what you digest that makes you healthy. So therefore, this is a very important topic. Now, impermanent means not that something comes up, then after one year it will go. Not like that. That is a grosser level of impermanence. In the realm of impermanence, there are grosser levels, there are subtle levels. Now, in the case, what we need to understand is the subtle level. In the case of subtle level, it refers to the momentarily changing state, the very subtle momentarily changing state. For example, my, my death. Ordinarily, we think, you know, when you are born, then you celebrate, saying happy birthday. It's a good thing, very good thing. That's how we think. Then you are a little bit scared of death. But if you look carefully, the cause for the death is birth itself. So from that point of view, birthday is not something to be celebrated. If you are not born, you will not die. But itself is the cause for suffering. So therefore, it's, it's great teacher like Buddha who said, birth is suffering, aging is suffering, sickness is suffering, death is suffering. Meeting with people who you don't like is suffering. Not meeting with people who you like is <laughs> suffering. <laughs> Not getting the job you want is suffering. So there are, there are countless sufferings. So basically physical suffering, mental suffering. Right? So, <coughs> and then the second point, all contaminated things are suffering. All contaminated things are suffering means, contaminated here means anything that has to do with the arisal of negative emotions, anything that is in related to developing or connected to negative emotions leads to suffering. Now, for example, if you see a very beautiful object, then by seeing this object, if your attachment arises, your obsession arises, then that is contaminated object. All contaminated things are suffering, they lead to suffering. So ordinarily when you when when you when you are able to make friendship with somebody who re you really like looks good for us. But then gradually it will lead to suffering. So basically the when we talk about suffering, there are three levels. One, obvious suffering. For example, if you get headache, stomach, diarrhea, it's, it's obvious, not only to human beings, but to all animals. So that is something we all know. Now, there also we are not very, very good. In order not to have that kind of obvious suffering, you need to be very careful right from the beginning, what you eat, you know, what you drink, things like that. And Ajkal ki dunia mein, you know, in the market, you know, you, you get all kinds of packaged food, really not good, not healthy. All the soft drinks also packaged nicely, but inside, heaven knows how, how many months it has been staying there in a particular shop, things like that. But instead of that, drink pure water, it's much, much healthier, you don't need to waste money. So many things we, we can do, but you get so much junk food these days. And we, we are all going for the junk food, right? So we are not good even in dealing with the obvious suffering. Now there is a second level of suffering which is called suffering of change, which we don't pay attention. Suffering of change means 
when we meet a good friend, we feel it's good, but gradually you get separated, then you're suffering. That shows that it's not permanent source of happiness and peace. Now, for example, I'm sitting here, you are listening. It looks like you are interested, you are listening. Then I say, okay, now you are interested. So, uh, our earlier, you know, schedule was one hour talk and uh, 20 or 30 minutes question answer. But because you are very interested, I'm going to speak for another six hours. <laughs> Just by hearing that, you will start having some pain. <laughs> oh my God, this is too long, you know. In, in economics, it is called the law of marginal utility. When you are hungry, you eat one bread, chapati, good, two chapati, okay. Then gradually, if you, eat that, if you force yourself to eat more, instead of you know, enjoying it, you will, you will vomit. Law of marginal utility. So that means those, are, those can give you a little bit of temporary peace and happiness, but not long lasting happiness. They are not the source of long life. They are actually suffering, leads to suffering. If you are sitting for a long time, then after that you stand up, you get some peace, happiness. But if you keep on standing, never sitting, <laughs> again you get problem, you see. So therefore, with whether it is a relationship, whether it is acquiring new things or moving into new circumstances, don't see that as permanent source of happiness. Whether you move into America or Europe, you know, people are doing that all the time. America, Pongea. You know, shuru shuru at me, just like honeymoon period, you know, you feel happy because of your mind, your expectation, things like that. Ek bar me once arata, one time I was flying from America, America and uh, there was a halt in Germany airport. Then I met one very Indian, nice Indian, you know, young man. So we were sitting together because we had, I think, three or six hours there layout. So we were discussing. Then he said, Guruji, now I don't remember that date he mentioned, date and time he mentioned. Guruji, on such and such date, I made the biggest mistake of my life. <laughs> then he said, I moved to America. <laughs> so, you see, grass is greener on the other side, you know. So, people don't know how to enjoy the things that they have. They always think there will be always. Uh, even when you go to the restaurant, when you order food, you know, you order something. Then you see someone else has ordered something on the other plate which looks nice. Then you say, oh, I have made a mistake. I order this. This is our mental attitude, you see. Right? So therefore, my, my point is the second level of suffering, which is suffering of change, which we normally see as happiness. So that should also be now understood as source of suffering and not source of permanent happiness. Then finally, there is a third level of suffering, which is called conditioned suffering. That you are experiencing suffering of suffering, you are experiencing suffering of change because there is a fundamentally something is wrong. This psychophysical aggregate, this body mind itself is the problem. What kind of body you got? The body you got is not made of stone, it's no, not made of diamond. It's a very fragile body, susceptible to all kinds of problems, difficulties. So, if you have a body, then you have a problem. When you are taking such a body, you are bound to experience suffering. And then similarly with your mind, which is not trained in positive qualities, positive emotions, you, you don't know how to cultivate positive mental outlook. With a slight you know, ups and downs, you feel miserable, you know. Then you start you know, complaining. So, when, when your mind is so weak, you are bound to experience all kinds of suffering. Now, why, why, why did I get this body and mind? I got this body and mind as a result of the causes and conditions that I accumulated in the past. So, therefore, the point is now you should make attempt in the spiritual practice so that in the future you get enlightened body, enlightened mind, which is impossible like Buddha's body, which is you know, beyond suffering or at least the life of a bodhisattva because of the bodhisattva's attitude you know, will not suffer also. Or even in our case, if you change your mental attitude, there will be less suffering, much less suffering. And during the COVID, this pandemic experience, we have seen that people who have some spiritual practice, who know how to think, they suffered less. 
people who always been going to the restaurant and going with, with the friend and inside completely hollow and then suddenly they are isolated they, they have no idea what to do and many of them are almost almost becoming crazy you see right so therefore uh, anything so so the main point is as i said earlier the source of all types of suffering is negative emotions so for a practitioner our enemy number one is negative emotions not outside enemies the so called external enemy the human enemy they may be enemy but if you bleed you know if you submit to them to their degree say i will do whatever you say please spare my life they'll spare your life or also you can run away from them but when you have this negative emotions in your brain in your kopri <laughs> wherever you go those are there you see so unless you remove those negative emotions from yourself there will always be problem then the third point is all phenomena are selfless and empty so that means all phenomena means whether it's you as a person or any other object that you see around houses and trees and uh, you know books and uh, uh, televisions and whatever outside any any phenomena permanent impermanent any phenomena they are selfless selfless means is not saying especially in the case of the person when we say selfless of the person we are not saying there's no self here self means in independent existence as i explained yesterday so selflessness of person and selflessness of phenomena means whether it's the person who enjoys this host of things or the the environment where the person live anything that is you know perceivable if you scrutinize if you observe their you know nature there's nothing that has independent inherent existence so when this same thing is you know descend on the person we call it selflessness of the person the person has no independent existence it is also dependent on causes and conditions it is also simply designated i mean look at the fun for example i i for example i call this paper you know why why can't i call this mic there's not much reason behind it somebody in the beginning said this is paper then people later on people didn't see any problem to say this is paper everybody agreed so it's all through agreement you know otherwise there's nothing paper called paper if somebody had write in the beginning called this paper elephant today it will not be surprising if i say i'm reading from the elephant now if i say <laughs> then they will say now geshe lagdo is insane out of mind so these are all designations so handsomeness beautifulness these are all our mental imputation you see so again pointing to the same thing that your your mental you know perception of the reality is so important if you see the reality then instead of what your mind wants to project then the reality is such that nothing has in inherent independent existence <laughs> so through the understanding of this realities like impermanence uh renunciation removal of suffering and selflessness then you will gradually transcend suffering so nirvana is peace so nirvana sometimes it is called transcendence of suffering you attain nirvana because you you either you are in the samsara or you are in the nirvana you are in the samsara because of ignorance ignorance means seeing things as having independent existence now through your you know spiritual practice when you see things as having no independent existence and develop the wisdom which sees shunyata or emptiness then you are able to cut the root of ignorance the root of samsara which is ignorance ignorance is misconception of reality wisdom is a conception which understands the way things are these two are contradictory these two are mutually exclusive there cannot be a third possibility right so therefore this wisdom understanding emptiness or shunyata is the direct counter force to eliminate that ignorance which is the root cause of suffering so once you remove a root that cause of suffering you get liberated you achieve nirvana so nirvana in buddhism is not a special place even if you use the word heaven 
It's not a special place where you go. It's not like going to Switzerland or things like that. It's basically elimination of the negative emotions, the seeds, imprints of negative emotions from your mind. The same person with the same body might achieve that nirvana, that liberation. So it's a state of mind. So, so these are basically the, the meaning of the, the four seals. And especially for actualizing that nirvana, you need to under, you know, undertake this threefold practice of shila, samadhi, parja, morality, concentration, and wisdom. Out of these three, morality is the foundation. Now, morality basically means proper way of life. Proper way of life means a life where you do not harm anybody. So, morality is basically talking about restraining the restrain number one, restrain restraining the negative emotions. Right? Number two, practicing positive qualities. There's also morality. And the purpose of the first morality, which is restraining negative emotions, and second morality, which is cultivating positive emotions, is at the end of the day to help other suffering sentient beings. So, helping other sentient beings is the third category of morality. So, morality basically is of three types. Removing negative emotions, cultivating positive emotions and helping other sentient beings. So, morality, the word morality in Buddhism has no connotation of a discipline that you must observe imposed upon you by external force. Here, we, when we talk about morality, we are talking about morality which you must practice for your own benefit, for your own happiness. Not because somebody forced you to do that, right? So, so that 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 morality in Hindi we call it shil. Shil is actually a word coming from shitalta, coolness. So, when you did that life of moral morality, where you don't harm anybody, where you help everybody, then you have nothing to hide, nothing to regret. When you have nothing to hide, nothing to regret and repent, then your mind remains cool, chill. When your mind is not disturbed by negative emotions, it's calm and cool, then you can concentrate. The second shiksha, second precept, concentration. When you are able to concentrate, then you can also analyze better. You can also have better capacity to develop that wisdom. So this, through this threefold practice, practice of development of morality, concentration, wisdom, you will also gradually, and as I already mentioned, the direct counterforce for removing ignorance is the wisdom. So, through that way, you will actualize uh, that nirvana, right? So, to start with, you should have a little bit understanding of your own mental attitude. You may not be ready to do many high practices, but start from those which you can and uh, then gradually when your mind becomes stronger and stronger then you can go for higher states of practice and get liberated. <laughs>